fifth Sunday in Lent. Next Sunday will be the Passion of our Lord, already uh, marking the beginning of Holy Week. Monday, Thursday, the 1st of April, we will have a 7 p.m. service only, and then on Friday, April the 2nd, we will have worship at 12.15 and at 7 p.m. So uh, you have uh, that information. And I want to mention one other scheduled item, you bet. Also next Sunday, on the 28th of March, uh, there will be a children's Easter egg hunt, early Easter egg hunt, uh, 
and the schedule would be held outside in the courtyard. And would that be at 10 a.m.? At 10 a.m. on uh, next Sunday. And in case of inclement weather, uh, it will be held in the lower narthex. Those are our announcements uh, for this morning. We now prepare for worship with the musical prayer. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Almighty God, Merciful Father, I, the Lord, 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 the our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, 
He gives power to become the children of God. He gives them His Holy Spirit. All who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, to us all. Amen. and saves us from sin. Be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judea. It will not be like the covenant that I made with my ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Yes, you only have my sin, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you see, and right in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you have like the truth deep within me, and would have me no wisdom deep within me. Remove my sins from this, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the body of the broken may rejoice. I my face from my sins, and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your evil spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me in your body of spirit. Reading from Hebrews, the fifth chapter. 
Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Sorry. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. For those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before giving the message, uh, one thing that I did not mention in the announcements was that sometime this week, the completion of refurbishing our organ uh, should be uh, completed. Or, uh, that completed. And either on your way out this morning or when you come up for communion and return to your uh, seats, um, just look up. Uh, the pipes have been uh, have been installed, and uh, if the if the music is half as beautiful as the pipes look, uh, it will it will be not only a sight but a sound to hear. In my younger years, I had some very memorable teachers, one of them early in college. A native of Scotland, he was an expert on the Middle East and was at the time teaching a course on the religion of Islam. Like most instructors, on the first day he handed out the syllabus, the schedule for the term. 
which listed each topic for every session. But something was missing. The due date of a special writing assignment. So one day about halfway through the course, I raised my hand and asked, Professor, what's the deadline for our essay? What's the date for turning it in? He gave him an interesting answer. Instead of replying directly to me, he began talking uh, to all of us students. The most interesting part was what he said. He described how in the first place to get started on writing an essay. He mentioned first, of course, that each of us had to use a theme, a particular subject to research. Then he briefly explained how to collect our thoughts and put them into some kind of order. Last and most important, he said that at some point, we simply needed to get a paper tablet, sit down at a desk or a table, and pen in hand, start writing. And that was it. He never mentioned a due date at all. He never gave us any deadline. Instead of reducing my anxiety by answering the question of when, he answered the question of how. How does one get started on a writing assignment? So in the end, what he gave us was something much more useful, much more valuable. In the Gospel, some strangers, either Gentiles or more likely Greek-speaking Jews, they wish to see Jesus. Obviously, they have heard much about the teacher and miracle worker, but desire as well to see him in person, to talk to him face to face. Maybe that request is not unlike me, wanting to know just when to turn in a writing assignment. And not unlike my instructor, Jesus' response is not only indirect, but also expresses something much more valuable. He tells everyone within earshot that he has reached a special moment in his ministry. No longer will he be engaging the public. That time is coming to a close. It is their last opportunity to hear and learn and come to believe in him. From now on, until his trial and execution, he will be spending his time exclusively with his closest followers, telling them how much they mean to him, and among other things, reassuring him, though he will soon make his departure not to worry, for the Spirit will come to comfort, guide, and empower them. As he often does, Jesus uses picture language, this time describing what his death will be like. He compares it to a grain of wheat, whose purpose is, in a manner of speaking, to die, that it might bring forth a new plant, a plant that will in turn produce many grains of wheat. Strangely, he talks about that not only as a moment of sacrifice, but also glory. That's part of the mystery of Jesus in the Gospel of John identifying two things at once, two things that, that go together, but sometimes even seem to be nevertheless opposites. In John, we also witness another important thing about Jesus. He always seems to know ahead of time what's going to happen. And he seems to, to be almost in complete control of the circumstances swirling around him. Not only that, but he also can seem rather calm, almost dispassionate. In 
whatever circumstances he finds himself. For example, he thinks out loud, he declares, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He seems so confident, so self-assured. And for me, that can be sort of a problem. He just sounds too much like the divine Jesus, the all-knowing Jesus, the sitting in the driver's seat kind of Jesus. Once when mentioning this to a professor in seminary, he smiled and said to me, yes, in John, Jesus often seems to walk one or two feet above the ground. For the sake of comparison, just listen to him praying in the Gospel of Mark, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even unto death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. And then ending, yet yeah, not what I want, but what you want. And these words added in the Gospel of Luke, in his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Again, in contrast, in John, he most often sounds so serene, so in command. Yet, even in that gospel, he's not always that way. In a few places, he is very different, in fact, very passionate. As we saw two Sundays ago, when in the courtyard of the temple, he found cattle and sheep being sold for the Passover. And making that whip of cords, he drove out the animals and overturned the tables of the money changers. And he said, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house into a marketplace. Also, when he encountered Mary on the death of her brother Lazarus, when she came to where Jesus was and he saw her weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit, deeply moved, and he himself began to weep. Yet another way that Jesus in John is like Jesus in the other Gospels. He calls for the very same commitment of those who would follow him. And in John, he actually expresses it in even stronger language. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. None of the other Gospels goes quite that far. And another jolt that John gives us is this. Just last week, we heard Jesus say that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that those who believe in him may have eternal life. <clears throat> What's going on? Which is it? Is the world to be loved or is it to be hated? Well, it might just depend. It might be a matter of emphasis and of timing. On the first, Jesus opposes not so much the world itself, but more so the ruler of this world. And we know whom Jesus is talking about. And as far as timing goes, again, Jesus is reaching the end of his public ministry. 
for the crowd gathered around him. Now is the time for a decision. Which matters more? Many things that in the past have uh, meant a great deal to people? Or instead, one's life-giving relationship with God? Not only in the life to come, but also here and now. Just as it should be, the season of Lent is always a good opportunity to reflect on such things, where we are in relation to others and the world at large, and especially we are where we are in relation to God. Earlier in John, Jesus says, I came that people may have life and have it abundantly. That's true, but, but in order to live, sometimes some dying has to happen. It's simply the order of things, like that grain of wheat being buried in the ground. In spring, new life takes hold, but only because of the decay that comes at the end of autumn, but also that deep sleep in the dead of winter. We don't always think about those things. Most of us are somewhat uh, divorced from the patterns of nature. Even those of us who have yards uh, at our homes are accustomed to simply raking up leaves in the fall, bagging them and having someone else um, uh, pick them up and take them away. And if we have a dead tree on our property, well, we call a landscaping company to come cut it down and remove it. But it would, that is unless maybe you have a bus saw at home and you know how to do those kinds of things so that the tree doesn't fall in your house. But in wooded areas, such human actions don't often happen. Instead, fallen leaves, blanketing the ground, remain, slowly deteriorating. And if a creek or a river flows nearby, uh, some of them end up in the water. A few make it to the bottom while the rest uh, flow downstream. And as far as dead trees go, they also eventually fall down. Over time, dampness, mold, changes in temperature, dissolve the wood into a very fine mulch, which then enriches the soil uh, from which the tree came in the first place. Jesus proclaimed, and I, when lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Is Jesus talking here about his death? On the cross? Of course he is. But that's not all. He's also predicting another event. Being lifted up and out of the grave. He's telling us that death and new life are sometimes two sides of the same coin. You know, one coming first and then the other. And that they can't even overlap. As we age, as we grow older, as we inch ever closer to death, Jesus blesses us with new life, the abundant life. He is that one grain that dies so that much fruit may be born. And in that way, he continually lays out before us the foretaste of the feast to come. Amen.
As you're able, I invite you to stand and join with me in confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father is the Almighty, and the Lord and the Lord, 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 the Lord
This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Please be seated.
Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, living God, for the body and blood of your Son, which sustains us in the wilderness and the garden of life. As Christ has loved us in this feast, so send us to love Christ in our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.